There's one more thing, one more announcement before we do our sermon bumper. Uh, I'm not preaching today. Cool, cool. If you were not with us in our uh, annual family meeting, congregational meeting, we made some announcements in there, and one of those was that we took somebody who's been a, an anchor and a longtime leader in the church, and we made them, we gave them an official role. Um, and today, I am cannot tell you how thrilled I am that our executive pastor, Darlene Marciniak, is going to be bringing the word today. Go ahead, Jason. Life is a journey, and each of our paths is different. Sometimes we feel like we're just out for a stroll, and other times we walk with purpose. There are even days when our road seems treacherous. Have you ever wondered what it might have been like for Jesus to walk the road to the cross and how that impacts us? Join us beginning next week as we begin our series, The Road. Well, good morning. It's good to see all of you this morning. Thank you so much, Pastor. I appreciate the privilege to speak and your confidence in me. It's good to see you here this morning. I want you to know that sin will keep you from this book. But this book will keep you from sin. That's something that my mother taught me when I was little. She, she told us to write this in front of all of our Bibles so that it would remind us. And, you know, if you're not living your life pleasing to the Lord, you don't want to pick it up. You kind of leave it on the shelf and let it get dusty. But when you're living close to him and you're reading this word every day and you're letting it become a part of you, boy, it protects you from sin. When the enemy comes in and he tries to draw your heart away from God to do something that you shouldn't be doing, boy, this blocks you. It brings up all kinds of reminders of why you want to make the right decisions and do what God is asking you to do. Last week, Teen Challenge was here, as Pastor already mentioned, and it was such a pleasure to have them here. And uh, Darren Walker talked about serving God in the... He said, be willing to go to the hard places and reach the hard people. And he made a statement last week that I think is worth repeating. He said, if we invite the people that no one wants, God will send the people that everyone wants. So let's get out there and let's be willing to work in the hard places. So today I want to talk about serving God in the hard places. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for your sweet spirit that we've already felt here this morning. The evidence of your goodness has been all over this place this morning, Lord, and we're so grateful for that. We just pray that you would open up our hearts this morning to receive what you have for us. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. I want to talk to you this morning about four young men who found themselves in a hard place because of no choice of their own. You know, sometimes we find ourselves in a hard place because we've truly made bad choices and we've got ourselves there. But sometimes we're in a hard place through choices somebody else made, and it just ends up putting us there. So through no choice of their own, these four young men ended up in a very hard and difficult place. The four men I want to talk to you about this morning is Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Maybe you've heard of them. <laughs> Those of you that grew up in church, I'm sure you heard Bible stories about them from the time you were little. But this morning, I just want to share with you how they took a stand for God and how they served him in a hard time. Jeremiah chapter 25 gives us a little bit of background on how they ended up in a hard place. Jehoiakim was the king of Judah, and he was a very evil man. He did evil things in the sight of God, and he did not make good choices, and he had been given several warnings by prophets, by different servants, telling him that he needed to change and that he needed to draw close to God and that he needed to uh, change his evil ways and tear down the false gods, but he refused to do it. Time and time again, he refused. And so he aroused God's anger and brought harm not only on himself, 
but on all the people in his kingdom. And God told, uh, told uh, Jehoiakim that King Nebuchadnezzar would be coming from Babylon and would attack and besiege the land of Judah and that he would take them all captive where they would serve Babylon for 70 years. So God gave them many chances to do the right thing, but they would not do it. They would not make a decision to listen to God and do what was right. Have you ever felt like God was talking to you, maybe nudging at your heart to make a change, and you keep pushing against him? You keep saying, nah, God, you, not right now, or I'm not ready, or are you sure that's for me when you know all the time it is? Whenever God is nudging at your heart and giving you those warnings, you should probably listen to him so he doesn't have to bring somebody to besiege you and put you under control. Second, Second Chronicles chapter 36 gives some more background on the account of what happened. And it says, Jehoiakim was 25 years old when he became king, and he reigned in Jerusalem 11 years. He did evil in the eyes of the Lord his God. Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, attacked him and bound him with bronze shackles to take him to Babylon. Nebuchadnezzar also took to Babylon articles from the temple of the Lord and put them in his temple there. The other events of Jehoiakim's reign, the detestable things he did, and all that was found against him are written in the book of the kings of Israel and Judah. And Jehoiachin, his son, succeeded him as king. That's such a sad verse to read to me because this was a person that had been given chance after chance after chance. And the Bible even says he did detestable things. You know, God wants us to turn to him and turn away from the evil and detestable things in our lives. But because Jehoiakim was unwilling to change, his whole kingdom was taken captive. So they found themselves in a hard place through no no choice of their own. They weren't the ones that made this decision. Jehoiakim was the one that was being evil. So our story today comes from the book of Daniel. And we will see in the book of Daniel what happened to Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Six different times we're going to see how they proved God to be the true, living, only God. And that they honored him in a place, in a country where they did not honor God. So it, we're going to start out in Je Daniel chapter 1, verses 1 through 5. And it says, In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord delivered Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand, along with some of the articles from the temple of God. These he carried off to the temple of his God in Babylonia and put in the treasure house of his God. Then the king ordered Ashpenaz, chief of his court officials, to bring into the king's service some of the Israelites from the royal family and the nobility, young men without physical defect, handsome, showing aptitude for every kind of learning, well-informed, quick to understand, and qualified to serve in the king's palace. He was to teach them the language and literature of the Babylonians. The king assigned them a daily amount of food and wine from the king's table. They were to be trained for three years, and after that, they were to enter into the king's service. Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were among these young men that were chosen to serve in the king's palace. So the description that we just read that describes these four young men and, and the others that were chosen to serve in the king's palace. They had no physical defect. They were from the royal family or of noble descent. They were handsome young men. They were good learners. They were well informed. They were quick to understand. Now it doesn't actually say this in the verse, but through my studies, they're believed to be teenagers. Which makes sense because that's usually what kings want to select if they're going to train them to be in their service. They want to train them while they're young, hoping that they can direct their minds to do exactly what they want them to do. And another thing we know about them that it doesn't actually say is that at some point in these young boys' lives, they made a solid decision to serve God. Even though it doesn't say that, you see it in their lives. 
So I just want to tell you that you don't always have to be going around to everybody and say, I'm a, I'm a Christian. Did you know I'm a Christian? Did you know I serve the Lord? Because if you live it, they're going to see it. So you don't always have to just be shouting it. Live it. Let, let his love and his, his heart be shown through you. So these four young men could have grumbled and complained about where they found themselves, but they made a decision that they were going to do the very best they could in a difficult and hard situation. So let's talk about the six times they proved God to be the, first, the one true God. The first time was in the food and the wine. The king had ordered that all these young men that was being trained would eat food and wine from the king's table. Daniel didn't like that very much because Daniel felt like that would defile his body. And so he, he talked to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and he said, listen, let's, let's not eat the food from the king's table because that's not a good choice. And so they talked to the official over them, and they said, would you just give us vegetables and water? Because we don't want to eat the, the food from the king's table. Well, the official over them was a little nervous to do that because he did not want to present them to the king and them look weak and frail, and then he would get in trouble because they weren't taken care of. But Daniel talked to him, and Daniel said, would you just give us a 10-day trial? Just, just 10 days would you give us vegetables and water, and let's just see what happens. If we, if we don't look like we're healthy, we'll eat the food from the king's table. So the official said, okay, I'll try it. So for 10 days, he gave them vegetables and water. And at the end of the 10-day trial, they looked healthier and better than the ones that were eating the food and wine from the king's table. God did a miracle. And so they were allowed to continue just eating vegetables and water. And they remained strong and healthy. This was the first incident where they proved God to be true. Because God sustained them in ways that the world had a hard time seeing. They didn't think they would be strong and healthy if they were only eating vegetables and water. The second time was when Daniel was able to interpret a dream. Daniel chapter 1 verse 17 says, To these four young men, God gave knowledge and understanding of all kinds of literature and learning. And Daniel could understand visions and dreams of all kinds. When Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego finished their training, they were presented before the king, and they were found to be ten times better in wisdom and understanding than all the magicians and enchanters in the king's kingdom. God had empowered them to learn and to become better than everyone else. Not to lift them up, but to show that God was able. So one day, Nebuchadnezzar had a dream. And it disturbed him, and he wanted his magicians and astrologers and sorcerers to tell him what he dreamed and the meaning of the dream. They looked at him like they thought he had lost his mind. They said, King, nobody can tell you what you dreamed. And this made the king furious because he wanted to tell him his dream and the meaning. And so, because he was so furious, he ordered that all the wise men in the kingdom be killed. He just was, he had had enough, and he was just like, okay, just kill them all. So when they came to find Daniel, Shadrach, and Meshach, Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to kill them, Daniel said, whoa, what's, what's going on? Why, why are you wanting to kill us? And so whenever Daniel found out what the king wanted, Daniel requested to have a few days to see if God would reveal him the dream. And the request was granted. God gave Daniel some time, and so Daniel went to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and he said, we, we got to pray. This is a serious matter. If I cannot tell the king what he dreamed and the meaning of his dream, he's going to kill us and all the wise men. So they began to pray, and they asked God to intervene and to give Daniel the dream, which to us would seem like an impossibility, but to God nothing is impossible so then God granted their prayer, and he told Daniel what the king actually dreamed, and then he told him the meaning of it. So Daniel was able to share that with the king, and it had to do with future events that were going to be going on in that land. In Daniel chapter 2, verse 47, the king said to Daniel, Surely 
your God is the God of gods and the Lord of kings and a revealer of mysteries, for you were able to reveal this mystery. This was the second time that God was proven to be true through these young men. The third time, King Nebuchadnezzar built a golden image. It was 60 cubits tall and 6 cubits wide, which for us today, that's almost 100 feet tall and 10 feet wide. It's no little statue. He built this big statue of gold, and he put it out there, and he was so proud of it, and he summoned all the leaders of the land to come and admire his statue. And so while they were all standing there admiring his statue and looking at what he had built, he said, now when the music plays, you have to bow down and worship my statue or you will be thrown into a blazing furnace. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego happened to be in the crowd that day. And when the music began to play, everyone except for Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and for Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Daniel wasn't mentioned this time. <laughs> Everyone bowed down except for these three men, young men who took a stand for the Lord. They didn't know what was going to happen to them. The threat was to be thrown into the fiery furnace. But they knew in their hearts they were not going to bow down and worship a golden image. Their, their worship and their devotion was to the one true God, and they would not bow down to this image. The king was so mad, he called them before him, and he said, do you realize I'm going to throw you in the blazing furnace? And he said, I'm going to give you one more chance. When the music plays, bow down and worship my golden image. So the music played again, and they did not bow down. In Daniel chapter 3, verse 17 and 18, they responded to the king, and they said, if we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to deliver us from your majesty's hand. But even if he does not, we want you to know, your majesty, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold that you have set up. Amen. They took a stand and they did not bow down. They were tied up and they were thrown into the blazing furnace. And immediately the king jumped up and he said, wait a minute, didn't we throw three men into the blazing furnace? Because now I see four walking around unharmed, not burned. He called them out of the blazing furnace. <laughs> they didn't even smell like smoke. They were perfectly fine because God had protected them. God was walking with them in their hard place, and God will walk with you in your hard place. Amen. Daniel chapter 3, verses 28 through 29 says, Then Nebuchadnezzar said, Praise be to the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and rescued his servants. They trusted in him and defied the king's command and were willing to give up their lives rather than serve or worship any god except their own god. Therefore, I decree that the people of any nation or language who say anything against the god of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be cut into pieces and their houses be turned into piles of rubble, for no other god can save in this way. This was the third time they proved that God was the one true God. The fourth time, Nebuchadnezzar had another dream. Now, this time, he actually told the dream. He told the dream to his magicians and his astrologers, and he said, tell me what the dream means. And they didn't know. They said, we, we don't have any idea what that dream means, King. So Daniel was called in, and Nebuchadnezzar told Daniel the dream. And Daniel was actually, he knew the interpretation, but he was nervous to tell the king the interpretation because the interpretation of the dream Declare judgment on the king. And the king said, tell me, because I know you know. And so Daniel said, well, King Nebuchadnezzar, even though you have seen God move, and you've seen him protect us, and you've seen it proven to you time and time again that God is the one true living God, and you've even told the other people after incidents to bow down and to worship the one true God. And you've told them to serve that God and that, or that you would actually cut them into pieces. But you yourself 
have never humbled yourself before God. You have remained a prideful man. And because of that, God has said that you're going to live with the wild animals and you're going to eat grass like an ox. And for seven years, you'll be like that. And at the end of those seven years, then you will humble yourself before God and you will serve him. Exactly one year later, the dream came to pass. Nebuchadnezzar became like a wild animal. He ate grass like an ox. His hair grew long and scraggly. His, his nails grew long like claws. And for seven years, he lived like that. At the end of the seven years, his sanity was restored, and he was restored to his throne. Then he finally humbled himself before God and submitted completely to him. Daniel 4.37 says, Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and exalt and glorify the King of Heaven, because everything he does is right, and all his ways are just. And those who walk in pride, he is able to humble. Don't wait until God has to humble you before you submit to him. Don't, don't wait until he has to turn you into living like a wild animal or whatever else he chooses because God knows what, what it will take to, to show you how to live a humble life. This was the fourth time that God was proven to be the one true God. All the times that, that Nebuchadnezzar had seen God move, he even, offered, he even ordered his people to serve the one true God, but he wouldn't submit. Sometimes it's easier for us to see how somebody else needs to change instead of seeing how we need to change. In Matthew chapter 7, verses 3 through 5, which we'll read that this next week as we're reading through Matthew together, it says, Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank that is in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye, and then all the time there is a plank in your own eye? You hypocrite. First, take the plank out of your own eye, and then you will be able to see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. Let's ask God to search our own hearts to see where we need to change. And let's learn from those who have paved the way before us. You know, uh, people that have gone before us have learned lessons and taught us stuff. And sometimes we just feel like we have to do it all again ourselves. Go through the hard time, through the hard motion ourselves. When if we would learn from the people before us, it would save us some heartache. It would, it would help us to have more peace if we would learn from those that have gone before us. Yeah. I'm speaking of someone named Belshazzar who had a hard time doing that. He was Nebuchadnezzar's son. And he had actually watched the last few years of his dad's life when he lived like a wild animal. But Belshazzar wouldn't submit himself to God. He was a prideful man. And when Nebuchadnezzar died, Belshazzar became the king. The fifth time where God proved himself to be true was in a dream that Belshazzar had. Sort of a dream. It was a dream that, everybody, that was before everybody. <laughs> He was actually hosting a banquet, and while he was hosting his banquet, he had all the nobles there, and he was feeling all prideful and proud of himself and sure of what, what he was going to do in the kingdom. But he ordered that the sacred vessels that had been stolen from Jerusalem, from the temple in Jerusalem, to be brought into his banquet for them to use like common cups. And they poured the drink into all these cups, and the nobles were sitting around drinking out of these sacred cups. And God was not pleased. And a hand appeared in the room with them and began writing on the wall. I don't know about you, but if a hand appears this morning and starts writing on the wall, it's going to get my attention. <laughs> well, it got Belshazzar's attention, too. And he asked his... Uh, the people that were there, what, what does that mean? What does that writing mean that's on the wall? And they didn't know. They couldn't tell him. And they were pretty fearful at this moment because a hand had just appeared and written on the wall. Belshazzar's mother, Nebuchadnezzar's wife, remembered 
Daniel explaining things to Nebuchadnezzar many times. And so she told Belshazzar, you should call for Daniel. So he called Daniel in and he said, can you tell me the meaning of the writing on the wall? And Daniel explained it to him. Daniel said, since you were so bold as to drink from the sacred cups and have no regard for the one true God, God has called judgment upon you and you will be removed from your kingdom and it will be uh, divided between the Medes and the Persians. Belshazzar was thankful that Daniel had given him the news, even though it was bad news, and he promoted Daniel to the third highest ruler in the kingdom. Even when Daniel delivered bad news, he still got promotions because God was directing and God was leading and God was the one in charge. Even though these evil rulers felt like they were the ones ruling things, all throughout this story, you can see where God was using Daniel and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to keep everybody focused on the one true God. That very night, Belshazzar was slain, and Darius took over the kingdom. This was the fifth time that God was proven to be the one true God. The sixth time is a story that you're all very familiar with. It's Daniel in the lion's den. King Darius admired the exceptional qualities of Daniel, and he planned to set him over the whole kingdom. The other leaders didn't like that very much. Have you ever been jealous when somebody got a position that you felt like you deserved? Or you felt like, you know, you were passed over and it wasn't fair and you might not have did anything, but you grumbled in your heart and you complained and you said, why, why am I being passed over? I deserve that promotion. Well, there, there were leaders there that did not like the fact that the king was wanting to promote Daniel. And so they tried to find fault in Daniel. They looked and they would watch him and they would see if he messed up somehow so they could go to the king and complain and show him all the ways he was doing it wrong. They couldn't find anything on Daniel. Wouldn't it be nice to live a life where nobody could find anything on you? <laughs> God can help us to do that. So they decided the only way they were ever going to find a fault in Daniel was if it had to do with his God. So they went to the king, and they appealed to the king's ego. And they said, oh, king, we have this great idea. Why don't you write a decree that for the next 30 days, nobody can ask anything of any god or any human except you? Well, King Darius thought that sounded pretty good. He kind of puffed up a little bit and said, okay, that sounds like a great idea. So he wrote the decree. The leaders knew that the law said, now Darius knew this too. He just didn't think it all the way through. Sometimes we, we take action without thinking things all the way through. So King Darius signed the law and decree, and the leaders knew that once a law had been signed into effect by the king, it could not be revoked. Now, the leaders knew that Daniel was in the habit of praying three times a day, and he prayed with his window open because he wasn't afraid for anybody to hear him pray. So the very next time Daniel went to pray, the leaders were standing under that window to listen, and they ran to the king. And they said, oh, king, we just heard Daniel praying to his God, asking for things. King Darius was distraught because he loved Daniel. And he respected Daniel. And he knew that he had been caught in a trap himself because he had allowed these men to appear, appeal to his ego. He so regretted making that decision, but he knew he couldn't change it. Have you ever made a decision that you regretted? The king said to Daniel, may your God whom you serve continually rescue you. And then Daniel was thrown into the lion's den, and the den was sealed. King Darius couldn't sleep that night. He paced to the floor. They couldn't get him to eat. He was a nervous wreck. He was so afraid that Daniel was going to be eaten by the lions. And at the first dawn, he went running back to that den, and he commanded them to open up that den. And Daniel's like, good morning. Oh, I had such a good night's rest. I used this lion over here for my pillow. This one snuggled up close to me and kept me warm. 
Daniel was perfectly fine, and the king was so excited. He pulled Daniel up out of there. <laughs> not one scratch, not one broken bone. His clothes weren't even torn. God had protected him, and God had taken care of him. This was the sixth time that God proved himself to be the one true God through these young men. We may not always understand the hard places that we find ourselves in, but we can always trust God to be with us. In John chapter 10, Jesus is talking about the good shepherd, and he's talking about protecting his sheep and watching over them. And verse 10 says, The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. The thief wants to destroy you this morning, but God wants to rescue you. God wants to help you in those hard and difficult places that you find yourself in. Whether they're your choice or the choice that someone else has made, God wants to be there to help you and to direct you. Would someone come to the piano this morning, please? When you find yourself in a hard place, I want you to remember that there is a God that loves you. The God of Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego loves you just like he loved them. Maybe this morning you're here today or, or maybe you're watching online and you say, that's me. I'm in a hard place this morning. I'm, I, I don't know. This, this situation is so difficult and I'm just struggling even if it's not choices you made, you find yourself in a hard place and you think, God, I need your help. God is here and he wants to help you and he wants to give you a chance. He wants to rescue you. If you're watching online and this is you and you're going through a hard time, I just want you to type in the word struggling this morning and we'll know to pray for you because God loves you, whatever it is that you're going through. Maybe you're here today and you're watching online and you say, I, I don't know this God you're talking about. I've never met him. I've never had anybody to love me like you're saying that he loved Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Is it possible that somebody could love me that much? Oh, yes. Yes, it is possible that somebody could love you that much because God does. If you're watching online this morning and that's you, and you're wanting somebody to love you like that, I just want you to type in the words choosing Jesus today. And we will, we will pray for you and ask God to help you, help you to meet this Savior that loves you so much. I'd just like to ask everybody to bow your heads this morning. If you're in a hard place this morning and you just need prayer, you just need God to give you protection and direction and wisdom, and you want us to pray with you this morning, would you just raise your hand? so that we'll know to pray for you. God cares about everything that you're going through this morning, and he sees you in that hard place, and he wants to make a difference in your life. If you're here this morning and you don't know Jesus, you've never asked him to be your Lord and Savior, would you just raise your hand and let us pray with you this morning? Anyone that wants to just ask Jesus into your heart this morning, Father, I'm so thankful for you, and I know that you saw the hands that were raised this morning, and you see the hurting and the broken hearts, Lord. You see the struggle. God, you see the difficult situations that they're in. And I just pray, Jesus, that you would just bring peace that passes all understanding. Lord, I pray that in the difficult times that you would just cause direction and protection and peace to be found. Lord, so many times when we're in a difficult situation, we want to pray and ask you to take us out of that difficult situation. But God, I'm asking that you would help us to be strong in you in those situations, Lord, and that you would help us to lean into you and to trust you. Father, those that don't know you this morning, I pray that you would just touch their hearts and that you would just minister to them. Lord, coming to know you is such a simple and an easy thing to do. All we have to do is say, God, I believe in you. Would you come into my heart and forgive me of my sins? Lord, I just pray that you would change these hearts this morning and that you would just cause them to surrender to you and to love you and to live their lives for you. Thank you for being the God that stays with us in the hard places and helps us through the struggles. 
In your mighty name we ask it. Amen. If you're here this morning and you ask Jesus to come into your heart this morning for the first time, would you please just let us know afterwards? We just want to celebrate with you and share the love of Jesus. Thank you for joining us this morning. Thank you for watching us online. I pray that as you go through this week that God would just direct you and protect you in those difficult places and let you know how loved and how special you are. Go and have a great and blessed week.